Good evening and welcome to Phoenix Fellowship's interactive Bible study held every Wednesday evening. We are so glad you've come tonight. We have some exciting prophecy to study. And you'll find that as we get deeper and deeper into the book of Revelation, things get more and more interesting. It's so dramatic that you almost think that you're actually reading an inspired sci-fi novel. But the reality is, it's more real. It's more believable when you see what happens as we go along. But it seems unbelievable at first, more than anything that you've ever imagined. It's unbelievable. But it's believable. Believe me. <laughs> Thank you for joining us this evening. We would like to begin with prayer. Father in heaven, tonight you have been so gracious to us in giving us a picture of things that will take place at the end of the world. It's almost like a movie that you've given us, a video of various images and various actions that take place on the earth. And tonight I pray that the spirit who inspired John to write these things will inspire us and help us to understand these very important prophecies for our time. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So we need to go back. We don't want to lose the, the, the uh, continuity of our study at all. So I just want to go back very quickly and remind you that there are Four, there are more than four, but there are particularly four sets of seven in the book of Revelation. The seven churches, we talked about those before, we studied those before. The seven seals, and the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven plagues are sequences of events that are very closely connected with one another. And so we studied the, the seven seals. We studied, first of all, the four, four horsemen of the apocalypse in Revelation chapter 6. We have the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, and the pale horse. And these all represented um, activities. The riders on, the, on those horses represented emissaries, as it were, from heaven to bring judgments upon the earth, all except the first one. first one we discovered was Jesus Christ himself riding, conquering and to conquer in the person of his people. And the result was the fifth seal, where we, as, as his representatives at the end of time, actually experienced the opposition of the enemy as a result of the carrying of that final message to the world the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are representatives of Christ at the end of time. And some of us will actually have special roles in that particular venture. Uh, and we will talk about that as well later. So the fifth seal is actually the time of trouble, the time of tribulation. It's a picture of the tribulation that we as God's people go through while the world is going through a different kind of tribulation, but it is all the great tribulation. Revelation 6, 9 to 12 talks about the people of God crying out from under the altar, how long, O Lord, until you deliver us from this? How long until you come? And uh, in Matthew 24, Jesus says, beginning in verse 15, he says, uh, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, know that it's time to flee because there is going to be a great tribulation such as has never been from the beginning of time until now. Now, we know that that was a dual prophecy for Israel prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, but that great tribulation that is referred to in Matthew 24, 15 through 28 is actually a tribulation that, that, that the people of this world experience before Jesus comes. I would like to look at a slide that reminds us of the tears that 
prophecy often gives us because we're going to see this same pattern in the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven plagues. These three sets of seven, we're going to see a tear that looks a lot like the tear that we studied in Matthew 24 when we were studying those verses and that prophecy of Jesus Christ, which became the template of our study of prophecy. We had Jesus talking about wars and rumors of wars and things that would take place on the earth prior to the time of trouble. And then we had in verses 7 through 14 an actual time of trouble, which parallels the uh, riding of the red horse, the black horse, and the pale horse. Those three judgments, actually four judgments in those three horses as they ride and the riders ride through the earth. We had the sword represented by the red horse, the rider on the red horse. He had a sword in his hand, bloodshed. He had, and he takes peace from the earth. We had the black horse, which represents famine. And uh, we'll talk about that just a little later in our study tonight, because I think there is a reason that horse is represented as a black horse representing famine. Because again, it's connected. It's a connection. There's a connection between the seals and the trumpets and the trumpets and the plagues. So then we have the black, I'm sorry, the pale horse who brings with it pestilence and death and it says and the grave death and the grave followed it and a fourth of the earth died as a result of the actions of the rider on the pale horse so this is a time of trouble but not like we're going to see tonight but what i wanted you to see in that that slide of the of the matthew 24 tears is that we have a similar sequence of events in the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven plagues. Each set begins before the last of the one before it. And I'm going to try really hard to explain and show you this as we go through. Now in Matthew 24 and verse 29, Jesus said, immediately after the tribulation, of those days and he talks about in Matthew 24 this tribulation that the people of God and the world go through immediately after the tribulation of those days the events surrounding and including the coming of Jesus Christ take place and we have record of this in Matthew 24 which we would like to look at the summary of the texts uh, the the, uh, the a description of the things that take place that Matthew gives us of the events that surround and include the coming of Jesus Christ. And after that, we will look at another slide where Revelation 6 talks about the same thing and Luke 24, 21 talks about the very same things. We just look, like to look at these summaries together. First of all, Matthew 24, the sun will be darkened. Try to, try to kind of get the flavor of this as we go, because you're going to see it repeated. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. And finally, the Son of Man appears in heavens, the sign of the Son of Man. And as a result, the people of the earth will mourn because they have not received Jesus Christ as their Savior. And it says then we see Jesus Christ coming in the clouds of heaven. That's Matthew's version. That's Jesus' version, the one that he gave us in Matthew 24. Revelation, John gives us a similar picture. Let's look at Revelation. What do we have? We have a great earthquake. The sun becomes black. The moon becomes like blood. The stars of heaven fall to the earth and the sky 
then recedes like a scroll. Every mountain and island is moved out of its place. And there is abject fear in the people of this earth as they see the sight of Jesus Christ coming in the clouds. You see the parallels here. There, it's describing this same period of time that we're going to be talking about tonight. This time that takes place during the tribulation and just before the coming of Jesus Christ. Finally, in Luke, we see the signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, perplexity and distress of nations, the sea and waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear. And this one in particular, I want you to notice. Please notice this one because this is something that we will study in the trumpets. The powers of heaven are shaken. And finally, the end, the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. So this is the setting in which we will study the seven trumpets of Revelation. Now let's look at Revelation chapter 8. The first four trumpets are spoken of in Revelation 8. Then there are three more that take place in chapter 9 and the last one in chapter 11. And we're going to see some important things about how God has laid this out for us. Again, well, let's, let's look. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What happened to the seventh seal? We have the four horsemen of the apocalypse. We have the fifth seal representing the experience of God's people and the persecution they undergo during this time of tribulation. Then we have the sixth seal, which describes the events surrounding and including the coming of Jesus Christ. What happened to the seventh seal? Aren't there seven? Yes, there are. Let's read, beginning with verse 1 of chapter 8. The Bible says, When he, that is the Lamb, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. What do you suppose that means? First of all, let's get one thing clear. That half an hour is not a prophetic time period. John is, John is in vision. John is in vision. And he sees the seventh seal opened. And then there's silence in heaven. It's like there's a pause in all of the activity of heaven as the trumpets are about to sound because it is an incredible experience that is about to take place for the people on earth. There's silence in heaven. It's almost a, it's almost a pause of sacred, um, sacred awe, as it were, that immediately precedes the trumpets that we are going to read about and study about tonight. And this half hour, John is in vision. And that was his experience. He's in vision, and all of a sudden, everything goes silent for about a half an hour. In his experience, about a half an hour, he's, he's, it's like everything has stopped. And then in verse 2, it says, I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. They aren't sounding them yet. They're being given those trumpets by God. And then another angel. Let's look at this angel as we, as we read about this angel. Then another angel having a golden censer stood at the altar. He came and stood at the altar and he was given much incense 
that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. What is this a picture of? Who was it in the times of Israel that did this kind of thing? This was a this is a description of a priestly ministry. This is a priestly ministry. This is one of those examples in scripture where Jesus is identified as an angel, but it could be no other than him because only he performs the function of a high priest. And here he is using the imagery of the Old Testament as he takes the censer, the censer with coals of fire in it, and the prayers of the people, representing the prayers of the people to present before the Father, before God in the Old Testament, in the old sanctuary service, <coughs> the censer with the prayers of the saints. Maybe your prayers, maybe your prayers are in his hand. And then there's a very dramatic thing that happens. This high priest, this Jesus who is representing us in the heavenly kingdom, the heavenly courts, he, the angel who is Jesus, takes the censer, verse 5, and he fills it with fire from the altar, and it says he threw it to the earth. There's something in this that reminds me a little bit of the day Jesus died on the cross. The temple services were being conducted. This was Passover. This was Passover when Jesus died. He was the Passover lamb that was offered on the day of Passover, the day when the symbol of the lamb being sacrificed was actually about to take place in the temple. And as Jesus dies on the cross, everything stops. The veil of the temple is rent from top to bottom. There is no human hand that did that. And the most holy place of the temple, which no one went into except the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement, was rent from top to bottom. This veil was opened up and the most holy place of the temple where God was supposed to be dwelling and was in the Old Testament where Jesus was actually present in, in the Old Testament service. There was, there was light and there was his presence was there and the high priest would wear bells on the, on the bottom of his robe as he went in so that the people outside could hear those bells ringing knowing that he was still alive as he went into the presence of God. But now the censer which the high priest would always wave before the veil, the censer is thrown to the earth. Jesus is making some kind of a statement and I want to say and I believe with all my heart, and there's no one that has a better explanation of this. That censer being thrown to the earth is a symbol that it is finished. The same words that Jesus used on the cross as he gave his last breath and the, te the temple veil was rent from top to bottom. He said, it is finished. And this censer full of coals of fire is thrown to the earth. It's a symbol of everything coming to an end. All the prayers have been presented before God. And now the high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ has come to an end. He is about to mount his white horse 
and come to earth to redeem his people. And what happens? What happens when he does this? It says, there were voices, noises. Sometimes the word noises is used there, but voices is, is more consistent with other references to this. There were voices, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. Wow. Does that happen elsewhere? Yes, it does. In fact, in chapter 4 of Revelation, we read something very similar to that in verse 5. As the churches, the seven churches, and the messages to the churches are taken, and there is an end of that seven. In, in Revelation 4 and verse 5, it says, And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunders, and voices. Where else do we find that? This is a representation of the end, the end of this sequence of events. In the case of the churches, the end of the message is to the churches or to the church. It's the end of the message to the church from heaven. And, and the seals, this represents in, in chapter eight, this is an end to the sequence of seals as Jesus prepares to return to earth. Yes, there are other places where we find this. In fact, in chapter 11 and verse 19, look, if you have your Bibles, please have your Bibles. This is so, so critical that you be able to see these things in 11, Revelation 11, chapter 19, as the seventh angel that was blowing the trumpet ends his ministry. His mission is probably a better word. His mission to earth. It says in Revelation 11 and verse 19, then the temple of God was opened in heaven. There we go, right back to the time of Jesus' death. It is finished. And the ark of his covenant is seen in the temple. And there were lightnings and voices or noises and thunderings an earthquake and in this case great hail this is the end of the sequence of trumpets that are blown as we had the end of the sequence of the messages to the churches as we have the end of the sequence of the seals this is the very last of all that takes place under these sevens before Jesus again. I'm going to say, I love the imagery of it, so I'm going to say it. As Jesus Christ mounts the white horse and his armies behind him prepare to come through the clouds of heaven to redeem his people. This is the last. And these words are repeated over and over again at the end of each of these seven sequences, representing the very end of these events. Well, there's one more. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 18. Note, Revelation 16 and verse 18. What has just happened? The seven last plagues have been poured out. Do you remember when we were studying in Matthew 24 and Revelation 6, how everything came to an end. There was one tear, and then another tear, and then another tear, but everything ended at the same time. Uh, like like um, the seven, the, the, uh, the, three, the three judgments. And I'm going to repeat these judgments. There's the sword, the famine, and pestilence, and wild beasts. Those four, which we read about in Ezekiel last week. Those, those judgments which take place under the seals end with the words in Matthew 24. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. And then he goes into the great time of trouble, and it comes up right to 
the, they will see him coming in the clouds of heaven as the lightning shines from the west to the east. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. And then it goes on to talk about these events that take place in the heavens and on earth in Matthew 24, and it ends once again. Everything, all of these tears come to an end with the very last of events and the culmination of all of these things that result in the coming of Jesus Christ. So what does it say? We didn't read this. What did we say? Read. What is there in at the end of the seven plagues in Revelation 16 and verse 18? What does it say there? And there were noises or voices and thunderings and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake. And verse 20, and every island, get this, every island fled away and the mountains were not found. And great hail from heaven fell upon men. Mm. So this, I hope, is a help to you to see that all of these things, these sevens, these events that take place, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven plagues are like tiers of events. And each of them begin, by the way, each, be, by the way, the only thing that doesn't begin at the same, during the, the uh, trumpets are the plagues, because the plagues, let me go back. The seven seals represent the wake up judgments of God to the earth. Wake up the sword, taking peace from the earth. Famine, pestilence, these are judgments of God. We found that in the Old Testament in Ezekiel, and it's also true in the New. These are wake up judgments. They are severe. Oh my goodness, look at what we're going through right now. It's affecting the whole world, the economy and life on earth. It's, 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 Pretty serious what, what we are going through right now, but nothing like what will come in the seven trumpets. And the trumpets begin before the seals are finished. And the trumpets end at the same time the seals end, at the same time that the plagues end with the coming of Jesus Christ. And all of these phrases that we've just read about the thunderings, the lightning, the voices, the earthquake, the hail, the, the, the signs from the heavens, all of these things are things that immediately precede the coming of Jesus Christ. I want to look at one other text, and that's in the Old Testament in Joel, Joel chapter 2. Joel, again, is one of those minor prophets. It's surprising how much, um, how much of, well, how much, prophecy relative to the end of time we actually find in these these old testament minor prophets in joel chapter 2 i want to read verses 30 well 30 to 32 but i also want to read verse 1 in that chapter joel 2 chapter 1 before we go so that we can to see the context before we go to 30 to 32 i want to read verse 1 because it gives us the context of these other verses that we read. Listen to what Joel says. Verse one, blow the trumpet. Trumpet? Trumpet? <laughs> I'm studying trumpets tonight. There's a connection, which we will talk about next week. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble and they do, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. This is Joel talking about the very end of time, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, by the way, I'll just throw this in as a sideline. The day of the Lord is not actually the day that the Lord comes. The day of the Lord is a short period of time where the things that we're talking about right now 
take place and include his second coming. It's the very brief era before the coming of Jesus. It's the day of the Lord. It's like, it's like, a, it's like a period of time. And that's what Joel is talking about here. The day of the Lord is coming. It is at hand. And then we go to verse 30. Note the similarity in these verses from what we just read. I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness. Where have we heard that before? The moon into blood. Where have we heard that before? Before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And these things take place while people still have an opportunity to respond to the call of Christ to follow him. When the plagues fall, there will no longer be that opportunity. We will see as we read these trumpets, these first four trumpets, that it talks about a third of, a third of, and I, I want to comment on that in a minute, but this is still a time of calling. There's there is the seals, which the, particularly seals two, three, and four, which are the wake up judgments. Then there are the trumpets, which are the warning judgments. There's nothing left but to warn the world for what is to happen next. And then the plagues come only upon the wicked, those who have refused the call of Christ the rebellious of earth, those who have chosen. And these things are all part of a separating process for the people in the earth. They are to wake up the world to say, who are you going to serve? Is it going to be Jesus Christ? Are you going to follow Jesus Christ? Or are you going to follow after this power that we will talk about at another time, this power that is spoken of in Revelation 13? that is giving its mark of allegiance to people who, who honor it and who have uh, their allegiance to it, that power, as Jesus Christ has a mark, a seal that he places upon the foreheads of those who are, have allegiance to him and who are followers of him. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about so many things at once, but... It's just so exciting. The deeper we get into Revelation, the more exciting and dramatic it becomes. So what does Joel say then to make my point that the opportunity for people to turn to Christ is still open during these trumpet judgments? And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is not willing, it says in Peter, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to life, come to him. But things have to be stirred up in this earth in order for the world to wake up and know that there is a day coming when Jesus will return. There is a day coming when there will only be two groups of people on the earth, those who are lost and those who are saved and safe. In Christ. Can you see the importance of this gospel message that has to be proclaimed and will be proclaimed, it says, and the 144,000 will have a special role in that, by the way. Again, we will talk about that another time. So now I want to talk. What I'd like to do first is to read. Read these first four trumpets. And then I would like to just make a comment before we close. These first four trumpets don't require a lot of commentary. These events that are spoken of are literal events. I need you to hear that before we read them. The events that are given to us in Revelation chapter 8, verses 6 through 12, are literal events that will come upon this earth. And I will make a comment, a note about that after we read them. Let's look at Revelation 8, 
beginning with verse 6. In verse 5, the angels who have had, had been given the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. That's verse 5. Verse 6, I'm sorry. Then in verse 7, the first angel sounded. Hold on to your seat. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire mingled with blood was thrown to the earth, and a third of all the trees were burned up, and all the green grass. That ought to wake up a world, wouldn't you think? Not going to comment on that anymore. It's a literal event. That's exactly what happens. Hail and fire mingled with blood are thrown to the earth. And a third, a third of all the trees and all the green grass are burned up. Why a third? Why a third? There's significance in that. A third shows the restraint of God upon us. It is a warning, not a death decree. This is a warning to the earth. There is still restraint. There is still opportunity for those who see these events to come to Christ. A third. Under the plagues, it says, all of those who have the mark of the beast receive the judgments, these final punitive judgments of God. We have the wake-up judgments of the seals. We have the warning judgments of the trumpets. And we have the punitive judgments of the plagues that fall only upon those who have rebelled now in full rebellion against Christ. Anarchy <laughs> against the kingdom of heaven. How about that? Anarchy. That's a word that we use a little bit today. Anarchy. They are in anarchy against the kingdom of heaven. Note the second trumpet that sounded. And it says, the second angel sounded and something like a great mountain. Try to imagine this. Something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And of the, a third, a third of the sea became blood. Something like a great mountain thrown into the sea. How many of you have seen the movie Deep Impact? A number of years ago when I saw that movie for the first time after having taught these studies in the book of Revelation, particularly on the seven trumpets now, I thought to myself, if that isn't a picture just an example of what it will be like when the second trumpet sounds. Then the third trumpet. Oh, it says, a third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. A third, a third, a third. There's still restraint. This is still warning. Then verse 10. Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. You can almost see this. And it fell on a third of the fresh waters, the rivers, and on the springs of water. The second trumpet affects the sea, the sea, the ocean. The first trumpet affects the trees and the grass on the earth, the green things on the earth. The second trumpet affects the sea or it impacts the sea. Something like a great mountain hits the sea and destroys a third of the ships and a third of the life in the sea. And the third trumpet affects the rivers and the springs of water. One by one, these judgments are coming from heaven to wake up that final wake up call to the world. And then it says in verse 11, 
and the name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many died from the water because it was bitter. Hmm. Before we go to the fourth trumpet, I want to go back to chapter 7. I told you we would come back to chapter 7 just for a couple of verses. We have a picture of an angel or angels holding the four winds of strife in the earth in verse 1. We have, well, let's read it. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on what? The earth, on the sea, or any tree. What is this in reference to? Right across my Bible, right across to the next page. What do we see being affected? The earth, the sea, the trees. And then I saw another angel ascending from the east. East always represents the direction of heaven. We won't go into that right now, but the Son of Man comes from the east. He is the king of the east from the Old Testament. That term he is the kings of the east represent the hosts of heaven as they return to earth. The kings of the east. And this angel had the seal of the living God. We talked about, just mentioned, that this, this power that is spoken of in Revelation 13 that is in, in opposition to, it's the Antichrist. <laughs> I'm just going to say it right now. It's the Antichrist. In Revelation 13 speaks of the Antichrist. He is opposing with all of his power the God of heaven, and the people of God. And he has a mark that he will put on the foreheads of those who, who give allegiance to him to designate them as his followers. And God has a mark too. And this angel has a seal of the living God, a mark. Uh, and something that notes denotes that this person belongs to Christ. That's when the populace of the world is being separated into two groups. Everyone before Jesus comes will either have a mark from this Antichrist power, or they will have a mark from the angel sent from the east, a mark of God, a seal of God upon their foreheads. Both a sign of allegiance to the one that they are following. Just two groups then. And it says, he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So what does that tell us? That tells us that these trumpets represented in chapter 8, that were these judgments that affect the trees and the sea and the earth do not take place until God has placed his seal upon those special individuals that are designated as the 144,000 who have a special mission in the earth they will receive that stamp of God's eternal mark of acceptance and the safety that it gives them in Christ forever and ever. They become, and by the way, they have a special place before the throne of God in chapter 14. So, so we know, this is another example of how these sequences of seven overlap one another. The seals are not completed until the trumpets begin, and the trumpets begin not until the servants of God, that special group of people, have the seal of God placed in their forehead for the mission that they will have upon the earth for God. 
Now let's go to to verse 12 of chapter 8. Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third, again, a third, a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. And a third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. That's the fourth trumpet. And then John gives us an introduction to the last three, which take on a very different nature, and we will talk about them next week. The three woes, and I want to read that verse, verse 13, and I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels that are about to sound. That's our subject for next week. And before we go, I want to just share something with you. This is kind of a side note that is important in helping us to understand these prophecies. The specific identity of the characters of prophecy are often masked. They are often masked, the specific identity. But their actions are literal and accurately described in Scripture. Examples, the four horsemen. We have a red horse with a rider that has a, that has a, 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 a sword in his hand. We have a white horse with a rider with a bow that goes forth conquering into conquering. The conquering is a literal action that takes place. The rider is masked. The identity of the rider is masked. The rider on the red horse has a sword, and his actions are to take peace from the earth. The actions are literal, but his identity is masked. Same with the lamb, the lamb of chapter 5 that we read about last week. The lamb, he isn't identified as Jesus Christ. He is identified as the lamb that looks as if he had been slain. And he has seven horns, and he, he has a description. We know that it's Jesus Christ because of the things that follow. He is the one who gave his life for us. But his identity is masked. His actions are accurately described. The beasts of Revelation 13, and there are two of them in Revelation 13, they are not identified. This, their actions are very literal, but their identity is masked. So this is kind of a principle of Scripture that we need to understand. And one corollary to that is time periods are often mentioned, like the half hour. The half hour that we read about in verse 1 of chapter 8. The time period, the times that are given in Scripture, and the numbers that are used in Scripture, like 200 million horsemen, we find about in, in, in uh, the next chapter. There's, there's 200 million. There's 144,000 that are sealed. That's a literal number. The numbers are literal unless there is evidence that those numbers in the context of that scripture are being spoken of in a figurative way, such as the children of Israel went up to the edge of Canaan. They sent in 12 spies. The spies came back. Ten of them said, it's scary in there. Nobody wants to go in there. And all of Israel said, okay, we're not going. We're afraid. We're afraid of those giants. Caleb and Joshua said, no, we have the Lord on our side. We can go. We can conquer this land. And as a result of the rebellion of Israel against God's invitation to enter Canaan, he he kept them out of Canaan for 40 years. And the scripture says, in, Ch in Numbers, the scripture says, 40 years to the, for the 40 days of spying out the land. That, was, that is an example of how God will identify when something actually has a symbolic nature to it. 40, 40 years in the wilderness for 40 days, a day for a year, it says. It's the only time we use a principle 
of a day for a year or any fraction thereof. The Bible gives a number. It's the number. That's my humble opinion. It's the number. Unless the scriptures make it symbolic. And then we will see one more thing in the next chapter, and that is the first four trumpets are literal. They are literal events that take place upon the earth. The last three, actually the last two, the fifth and the sixth, the last trumpet is the seventh trumpet where we read about where heaven is opened up and the temple and the Ark of the Covenant is seen, and that's the end. The seventh usually represents in these sequence an end to everything. But in the three woes that are to follow in chapter 9, we have literal things happening, but a very spiritual covering. It's a very spiritual nature. Not literal, but spiritual. Spiritual. And you will see as we study chapter 9 that the things that happen are rather obscure, but the Things, the result of the action of these entities that are masked and the actions that they perform, and God says, woe to the world for those things that are to come, are actually of a spiritual nature. They are not asteroids coming and hitting the sea. They are not stars falling from heaven. They are not fire coming in the form of hail and blood. Um, to burn up trees and grass. They are not those kinds of literal events. These are spiritual occurrences that involve demons and the powers of evil. They have a spiritual nature to them. So we may review that again next week, but what I want to say is this is so exciting to me, and I hope it is to you, and I hope that we have a good discussion tonight afterward. Um, when we get together and talk. God bless you as you continue to plumb the depths and the mysteries and the wonders of the book of Revelation. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, tonight I am so grateful again, once again, for your revelation of Jesus in all of this and the disclosure of events that are to take place. Help us to realize that we are on the brink of eternity, Lord, and that there is a day coming when there will be no more evil and there will be a, re, a, a rescue of your people from the evil that will be taking place upon this earth before you come. Lord, I pray for every listener that they will turn their heart toward you and accept your invitation to belong to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.